Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, virtual press briefing by the UK and Changing Europe. I'm sure all of you, like me, are very much missing the cold coffee and stale croissants we're usually able to provide for you on these occasions. Uh, I hope one day in the not too distant future we can meet in person again and taste those wonderful croissants. We're here to uh, launch a report written by Sarah Hall and her collaborators, Scott James, uh, Lucia Qualia and Martin Hennigan. Uh, and we've got a wonderful panel to talk through some of the findings of the report. Sarah herself, who's Professor of Economic Geography at the University of Nottingham. Nicole Sykes, who's Head of EU Negotiations at the CBI. Peter Foster, Public Policy Editor at the FT. And Jill Rutter of the UK and Changing Europe. Uh, the system we're going to have for this is each, each of them is going to, well, Sarah's going to talk for about five to seven minutes. The other three are going to talk for about the same amount of time. Then we're going to open for questions. The way we're going to do questions is if you use your hands up, raise hands tool on uh, Zoom, I will try and come to you each and you'll be unmuted and you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, something will go wrong. It'll almost certainly be my fault, but that is how it's meant to work in principle. So without further ado, Sarah, can I turn to you to kick us off? Yes, thank you very much, Anand. I'm really um, pleased to be able to speak about the report this morning. So um, what the report does is that it takes as its starting point the fact that the UK is a services economy. Um, we know around 80% of the economy is services, or that that contributes around 30 million jobs. And I think crucially in terms of the Brexit negotiations, this really important sector has been shaped in quite fundamental ways by the UK's membership of the single market. So the EU is the primary destination for UK services exports. The UK runs a trade surplus with the EU in services. And some parts of services rely really heavily on um, EU nationals. That ranges from financial services right the way through to road haulage. The crucial factor that's underpinning that is the fact that the EU single market goes much further in terms of enabling cross-border services trade than is typical for other free trade agreements. And in the context of the current trade negotiations about what the UK's future trading relationship will be with the EU, that's critical. What's really interesting then is that despite this importance and the vital role of the EU, there's a really interesting parallel, I think, between the May and Johnson governments in that they've paid much less attention to services in terms of the whole Brexit process as compared to issues like manufacturing. Uh, heads up, there's a UK and a changing Europe report coming out on Brexit and manufacturing shortly and fish. And I believe there's one on fish as well. And I think the fact that services hasn't received as much airtime is, is really important to think about in terms of why that's the case. And here, I think it's important to note that the key issues for the negotiations on services are different to those of goods. So when we think about goods, we think about issues at the border, um, things like custom, customs checks, tariffs, etc. The key issue for services is questions of regulatory alignment or not between the UK and the EU. And because it's this focus on domestic regulatory alignment that really um, brushes up in some quite interesting ways with stated domestic policy goals of things like taking back control. So for me, one of the key issues in the negotiations is that the UK government sees regulatory autonomy as central to its plans in opening up other global markets for services, although it's less clear what those other markets might look like. On the other hand, the EU is clear that single market access can't be cherry picked under those conditions. And the EU is concerned to remove risks that it might see from the UK in terms of regulatory competition. So in more detail, what the report does is look at what the UK is asking for um, using the um, draft agreement published by the UK um, recently and thinks about what some of the implications could be for different service sectors. Um, if that were agreed, if an agreement were met with the EU, but also what might happen if an agreement wasn't sought. Much of the kind of um, public discussion about the um, UK negotiating position is that the UK has said, well, we're asking for the same as what the EU has offered other countries. Um, Canada is often used 
um, in that way. So one thing we did was look very closely at whether that is the case. And I think it's true to say that in some areas, the UK's draft agreement is exactly what the EU has agreed with, with Canada. But in other areas, the UK is asking for more access. Um, one area would be around who's licensed to sell services. So how you know a lawyer is a lawyer and whether a British lawyer, for example, can sell their services into France. Um, that isn't something that the EU has agreed with Canada. And the UK also wants a wider sectoral coverage than the EU is proposing. Um, and particularly critical here um, is the UK's inclusion of the film and TV industry, which is um, an area that the UK has competitive strengths in. It's not clear at this stage of the negotiations um, when such a deal might be secured, I don't think. And I don't think it's clear what that deal might look like. Um, I think it's important to note that because um, free trade agreements don't go as far as the single market does on services, at the end of the transition period when that comes, UK services will be trading into the EU on a different footing, either with or without um, a deal. And much has been made of some of the kind of precarity that that might give rise to for some sectors like financial services. Um, without a deal, I think it's fair to say that there would be new barriers for some businesses who are looking um, to export into the EU. Um, and we look at some of the issues that that might raise for different sectors in the report. Um, so questions around permits for HGV drivers and um, how film and television companies sell into the EU market. Um, I think just two final points. One is that how this plays out across the UK, I think is likely to be variegated. And we make note in the report that the service sector is not evenly distributed across the UK and different places have different sectoral foci. So I think that's important to note. And that becomes amplified when we think about how this process is going to be played out on top of the impact of COVID on the service sector. And um, so I think thinking about how it plays out regionally and in addition to the challenges and opportunities for some parts of the service sector that, that COVID has um, produced is going to be really important if we want to understand what the possible impacts could be at the end of the transition period for the UK services sector. I'll leave it there, Anand. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Uh, Nicole, it's very good of you to join us. I imagine it's all hands, at the, all hands to the pumps at the CBI at the moment. So thank you so much. And we look forward to what you have to say. Absolutely. And um, honestly, feels like a little bit of a blast from the past talking about services trade. That's delightful. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, I think one of the things that this report does, which is really important, is recognise that significance of services trade to the UK. Um, it really is one of our competitive edges. Um, we outstrip the rest of the G7 when it comes to the importance of services trade to us. We're the second largest exporter of services in the world after the US. So it is incredibly important. And as you say, um, the EU is the largest single market for those exports. Um, when, we, when I look at what um, sort of my members working in services trade with the EU um, want from a deal. I think you've identified well sort of the top kind of five things. Um, that sector specific access that you talked about for um, financial services and broadcasting. Um, but also for sectors like haulage, um, the transportation services um, uh, and, and indeed air, aviation services are all going to need quite detailed specific um, annexes in part of the deal. Um, or indeed separate agreements in themselves in order to, to be able to move goods around and to continue to function. Um, the second thing is then sort of a right to establish um, probably one of the most um, difficult things to negotiate and, and probably something where we're going to see our access change quite significantly. Um, sort of those abilities to be able to go and kind of set up your own business in Europe. Um, some of the uh, restrictions um, that we might be able, that we might be seeing, you know, Belgium and Spain, um, they insist on sort of a certain percentage of your board being residents of those countries to be able to set up, um, not restrictions that we currently face at the moment. There's some real practical um, uh, elements um, uh, there on establishment. Um, mentioned as well qualifications, professional qualifications in auditing, accounting, um, architects, um, and, and indeed even some medical qualifications as well that at the moment are pretty much automatically recognized. 
and in future are going to get uh, a lot more complicated. If you want to go out and be um, an accountant in Belgium, for example, at the moment, all you have to do is kind of copy and paste a lot of your, you know, uh, a lot of your qualifications. Um, in future, if you don't get the deal negotiated right, um, you're basically going to have to take another three years of, of education and testing before you're actually allowed to practice out there. So some real um, differences in terms of um, how you'll be able to function on that qualification side that are super important um, to our professional services businesses. Um, mobility as well um, uh, is, is really high up there. Um, uh, about half of our members see it as a threat to competitiveness, um, to their competitiveness as a business. If they can't get a good deal with on mobility with the EU, that ability to move people to and from quite flexibly, that's both kind of fly in, fly out services. So lawyers who just pop over the border and hop onto the Eurostar um, and go and provide their services, and and also sort of machine engineers that, that go out to Germany and install factories, etc. Um, and then finally, data as well, sort of um, a billion pound economy um, uh, uh, for the UK um, and getting data flows right is going to be incredibly important. We know there's a lot of politics um, that can cause difficulties around that. Um, sort of as, as you said, looking at the um, uh, what the UK is seeking from these negotiations, um, there is a fair amount of difference between the UK and the EU on some of these things, but on qualifications, on mobility, on data, and we do see a fair amount of ambition from the UK, actually. And, and, and you talked about sort of the airtime that services get. Yeah, services does get less airtime. It, it's more difficult to explain how services firms work because it's so difficult and it, different. And it, it's harder to imagine um, uh, how that works than, say, the sort of components that you can trace through the supply chain. Um, but I do think, actually, this government has done pretty well by services in what it's seeking from the deal. Um, uh, it might not get it, but um, I certainly think we've kind of gone from a situation where services felt they were being sacrificed to goods to actually hearing some of the opposite um, uh, way around, which, which may be that they're balancing out, who knows? Um, I think you touched very briefly on um, sort of the coronavirus and, and how that changes um, some of our trade and services. We know looking at um, the PMIs, they've dropped off a cliff, um, services trade is at the lowest levels that since those surveys um, began. Um, and if you, I, I do think that that changes not the deal that we're going to get, but certainly how services businesses feel about the deal um, and also what the sectors look like as we come out of this crisis. You know, if you are selling services where um, uh, you are selling from abroad right now, if you are one of those companies selling software into Poland or whatever, you are pretty much facing a drop off in your income right now, even though you can still practically do that. Um, demand is lower across the board in every sector. Um, if you are trading services through um, mobility, either by people coming over here and, and um, you know, we, we get services trade uh, value from people coming and visiting our hotels and our restaurants, you know, that is decimated right now. Um, uh, looking at our surveys, it's about negative balance of 100% in, um, in our travel industry in terms of profitability right now. Um, uh, uh, looking at our hotels, sort of negative balance of, of 75%. So really huge um, drop off in activity there. You know, that, that services trade is, has stopped. Um, similarly, you look at some of the kind of quite controversial conversations we're having at the moment around quarantine. We know that kind of flights are uh, in single digit figures compared with um, uh, uh, volumes previously. Again, that services trade has vanished um, and establishment uh, looking at um, uh, the Centre for Economic Performance, uh, they put out uh, a study on services trade affected by coronavirus saying that um, a lot of the business happening through that channel has completely stalled. Um, so we are in a very different environment. Um, and I think at this moment in time, talking to some services firms, they're kind of saying, well, the worst has happened. You know, you're not going to get worse than this. Um, uh, with the Brexit deal, um, but it is really important that we, um, that the negotiators going out and um, dealing with these very political and complicated issues um, do the best that they can because we're going to be clawing back every decimal point of growth that we can get. Um, and it is really important that we do what I can for our services businesses because it has been such a strength for us. We need it to come back and be a strength again. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Nicole. Uh, Peter, ready to go?
Thanks, it's Aaron. I'm very comfortable on a settee, I have to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> it keeps my old back, uh, my old back straight. Uh, uh, thanks, Nicole and Sarah. It's, it's fascinating to hear from the coalface, uh, Nicole. I, I find this report um, weirdly both both rather terrifying, but also uh, uh, rather encouraging. Uh, uh, to to Nicole's point about ambition. Um, Earlier this week, I was standing on the cliffs above Dover looking at the um, trucks rolling off uh, the ferries uh, uh, and it takes uh, three minutes and 54 seconds, I timed it, for a lorry to get from the back end of a a ferry uh, in Dover to the A2, A20. And there are 7,000 lorries uh, uh, that roll across that, um, just the short straights and the ferries every single day. And if you, uh, to the point in, in, in Sarah's report about haulage, if you look at uh, chapter 20 of the uh, uh, draft trade agreement, uh, it basically says that um, both sides will recognise each other's uh, uh, trucking permits. Uh, and so in that world, uh, everybody uh, is free to drive uh, their, their lorries back and forth. And actually 80% of the lorries that go across the channel are EU lorries. What happens in a no deal? In a no deal, we fall back on these things called ECMT, uh, if I have that acronym right, permits. There are 38,000 truckers in the UK, and even with the EU's enhanced no-deal plans, which, by the way, are not, as things stand at the moment, are not going to be implemented by the Commission this time round, but even in the enhanced scenario, I think we got 5,000-something monthly permits and an extra 1,000 annual permits. Well, if you imagine the gap between those two worlds, the deal world and the no-deal world, you start to wonder whether no-deal... Uh, is really workable. And uh, and I think so much of the same applies in other areas of services. And and the ambition that Nicole uh, uh, talks about in the the draft deal speaks to the fact that the government actually gets that. Uh, So so if we get into a world uh, where, um, you know, in mode four, we have no, in fly-in, fly-out services, we have no um, uh, 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 visa-free travel for businesses, uh, and we we really are back to uh, you know being uh, um you know as if we were from Azerbaijan or Afghanistan or Zambia or wherever you know uh, it's a kind of unthinkable world i think uh, and therefore it encourages me in the belief that actually there will be a deal and there will have to be a deal uh, and that's not necessarily a particularly popular view at the moment um but it is also true uh, uh, that the commission the negotiators, whether it's on fish uh, or on any of these services, chapters on, on some of the mutual recognition of conformity assessments that would facilitate uh, 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 trade in services or, or the services components of, uh, 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 of goods. Um, all these things are possible, uh, but they're all linked to uh, uh, the rest of the agreement. And it's why you're seeing a, a reiteration of what we saw last time, which is everyone throwing sticks at each other, uh, but with this belief that you know, come September and October, everyone's going to have to sit down uh, and make some serious compromises. And I still believe, actually, that that is what will have to happen. You know, there are obvious landing zones. You know, the UK has agreed to uh, a non-regression on a lot of the level playing field stuff, which the EU cares about. Um, you know, yes, there'll need to be a fix on on state aid. I'm not saying that's easy where the court, where the ECJ is concerned, but you can actually see when you look at this report, when you look at the draft deal of what the UK uh, is going for, if the UK is so delighted to have an Australian deal and, and, and fling itself off the cliff, why is it asking for this stuff? It's asking for this stuff because without it, the numbers are horrible. Those uh, projections done by NISA, Sam Lowe's done some at the Centre of European Forum, and in fact, the Treasury's own product projections, I think, Sarah, they're in your report, 60 plus percent drop off in services in a worst case no deal. And frankly, I don't buy that. I think some of those, no, num- those numbers are probably overstated when you talk to, uh, and I'd be interested in Nicole's view on this and, 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 and anybody on the call. When you talk to uh, manufacturers, you talk to farmer, you talk to haulers, logistics, etc., they are all genuinely scratching their heads about how it's going to work on January the 1st, um, you know, with the, with the uh, customs declarations, security and safety declarations for which we're not seeking a waiver, etc., when you talk to the services uh, firms, this may be complacency. I don't know, Nicole, what you, what you hear from your members here, but you do hear less of a panic. I, t- I take the point that COVID is a bigger, you know, what could be worse than COVID. But ultimately, when a vaccine arrives, COVID goes away. This is long-term 
friction we're talking about with the EU. Um, but you don't hear quite the same panic in the voice of services companies. I think audiovisual always knew they were going to be done in. The French won't have audiovisual, they never would. Uh, we go back to remember Theresa May's speech where she uh, put out the begging bowl for audiovisual. I think that's going to be a stretch. Um, but, but you don't hear the same, uh, quite the same panic that you hear uh, from, the, as I say, from the farmer and the manufacturers. And I wonder why that is. And I have talked to some people in Brussels uh, who model trade, who are much less pessimistic about the impact on services. You know, size and proximity cuts both ways. Are we really going to be in a world where there's mutual interest, even if we get into a patchwork of bilateral agreements uh, that for mode four, um, you know, immigration is going to be turning away people at the border. There seem to be a sense that there are more fixes out there. You get your Irish legal qualification. Yes, it's a bit of a pain. Um, now, I, th that may be wrong. It may just be complacency. It may just be that everyone's too busy with coronavirus. It may be that people haven't really thought about it. But I wonder whether actually the, the kind of gravity takes over in a good way uh, uh, when it comes to services. And, and yes, you have to establish more mode three, uh, but actually there will be a visa free, uh, um, there will need to be a visa free regime for tourism and business. Uh, um, you know, because if there isn't, you know, it, it, there is a mutual self interest in that happening. So maybe that's optimistic, but that's um, what the, the gumshoe reporter hears uh, around town when he phones up, when he phones up at relative companies and um, uh, and uh, ask questions. So on that optimistic note, I think that's that, that's my observations. I don't know why you need gumshoes if you're just ringing people up. But anyway, uh, we've got a couple of questions, written questions in, and we'll go to those. But just to remind people, what we're hoping to do is actually, if you put your hand up, and you all know from experience, I'm not a very good chair, so I'll probably miss people out. But we'll come to people and let them ask their questions directly. But we will do the three written ones we've had after we've heard from Jill. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief so we can get into questions very quickly. I think it's very interesting. Um, as Sarah said, under Theresa May, she was focused on goods, thought actually services were in a sense the sort of sacrificial lamb for her desire to end free movement of people uh, and was very focused obviously on the need to find a way of avoiding a hard border in Northern Ireland. That hard border was always going to be a goods hard border, never a services hard border. So the Northern Ireland protocol uh, doesn't cover services. It's a goods protocol. So that's sort of one of the sort of interesting issues. This government has been so convinced that it has to present its ask as a collection of the EU's greatest hits in other free trade agreements that it's underemphasized that it's actually asking for things for services. Um, because a zero quota, zero tariff deal is the deal that works for goods and frankly is the work good is the deal that answers the EU's principal concerns about trading with the UK after Brexit and appears to try to throw under a bus the UK's main interest, which is in maintaining our surplus in services, as Sarah's point, report points out. So I think it's very interesting that it was only really when Michel Barnier started talking about the extent to which the UK was cherry picking by asking for special arrangements on services that really came out that actually the UK was being slightly more ambitious than it appeared to be. But it's quite interesting because in all the talk that we've had about why the EU's trade agreements don't really work for the UK in the past and how the UK's independent trade policy was going to be better for the UK, the rhetoric from government has always been that this was going to be actually services for agriculture deals, that the UK would be using new trade policy to uh, make bridgeheads into services markets that it had failed to penetrate in the past because this hadn't been a priority for the EU in trade deals in the same way as it would be for UK trade negotiators. So I think in a sense, it's a shame that the UK hasn't made more uh, and more positively of what its services ask is. It's quite interesting when you go back through all the negotiating rounds, uh, there have been equal numbers of uh, sessions scheduled on trading goods as on trading services and separate strands on some of the transport issues that Nicole mentioned. This negotiating round is even more interesting because there are three scheduled sessions on services and only two on goods. So I think that's quite interesting. 
The danger, of course, for the services sector is that if the government is forced to do some sort of skinny FTA under duress in its very compressed timetable, which is the timetable that you require if you don't seek an extension, every indication is that the government won't, that the things that are too difficult to negotiate because they're new, they're different, uh, and raise lots and lots of issues for the EU will be those demands on services. Uh, so you will end up with a FTA that probably works quite well for the EU, an FTA that gives zero quotas, zero tariffs, everybody will hail it as a triumph, but it won't meet the specific needs of UK service sectors. So I think that's the sort of future thing to watch out for. I think the question on business is very interesting. Um, about uh, just over a year ago, we had a panel about why services interested featured so lowly in the uh, in the May uh, issues things. And people from the service sector were saying, well, maybe it's because it's been so dominated by financial services and the very, very strong arguments about why the UK didn't want to be a rule taker. Sarah's report uh, quotes uh, successive governors of the Bank of England talking about why the UK doesn't want to be a rule taker on financial services. That's one of the issues where the UK has come closest to exercising the Luxembourg Compromise to veto EU rules. We wouldn't be able to do that without a seat at the table. It's forgotten the rest of the service industry and Sarah's report shows business services are really sort of even bigger than financial services in those terms. So I think that's quite an interesting, interesting fact. It's a very diverse sector with very different interests and very different needs. It's not a very visual sector. So the pictures of uh, Peter can't go and stand anywhere to look at services exports shriveling away in the same way as he can go and check the chaos at Dover. So I think those factors, but I think the other reason why you hear relatively little from business is smaller providers are probably unaware still of the scale of the change they're about to face. Bigger providers have been marched up the no deal hill so many times already that they've probably made their adjustment plans already. They've moved staff, they've moved assets. Sarah's got a diagram, I think, of where financial services were already started moving to in the report. So I think they're actually, you know, they're getting their staff requalified with those Irish qualifications, etc. They know that it'll be advantageous to employ EU nationals who'll be able to move more easily and won't be subject to visa restrictions that might potentially be down the line. So I think we've seen some adjustment already that's okay for the firms. What it's not so great for is the UK economy because that income may move to other jurisdictions. That's a loss of economic activity and tax revenues. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. In fact, something that Jill just mentioned, I think ties in with John Pete's question. And John, I'm going to come to you in a couple of seconds to ask you to ask it. But we've got a question here from John Campbell that I just wanted to put to you, which is about the uh, NI protocol uh, and the question of how services interact with the protocol when it comes to both services embedded in uh, goods, so services packages sold by uh, Northern Ireland manufacturers. Will, will the situation be different for them under the protocol than for others in GB? And the second question, which is really interesting one actually, is could Northern Ireland based service providers who have Irish citizenship have intrinsic advantages over others who don't? I don't know if anyone, Sarah, will, I'll give you first dibs on all these, but you don't feel you have to answer everything. Yeah, I'm just going to unmute myself. Um, I think uh, the second part of that question is absolutely fascinating, and particularly actually so when you think about services, because Dublin is a really important centre for services within the EU. So the fact that Northern Ireland then becomes... Um, or well, obviously is now, but that relationship, I think, between Northern Ireland and Dublin on services is one to watch. And in, in previous periods of financial crisis, there's been some quite interesting work around what's happened in terms of um, Dublin. The um, other point I wanted to make um, in response to that question is that the Northern Ireland focus on services, as I understand it, is characterised by a much larger number of SMEs than is the case in other parts of um, the UK. And I think that speaks to a really important point about how some multinational service firms are probably rel relatively far advanced in their um, exit planning. I think the same isn't true for SMEs and that might play out particularly um, acutely in Northern Ireland, not least because of the issues around the protocol, but also because of the specificity of their service sector.
Does anyone else want to chip in? You don't all have to answer every question, but if anyone's got anything pertinent to say, you're more than welcome. Is Peter about to unmute himself? Does the, I was going to say, it's interesting that the, you know, the protocol has different bat regimes for goods and for services. And the, the bat regime for services is the EU regime, correct? Um, and that is an area, I think, where, they, where you are going to find best of both worlds um, for, for Northern Ireland. I, I'm not sure whether that's going to offset. We, we obviously remain to be seen how uh, the regulatory board is going to happen in the Irish Sea, whether that's given the makeup of the uh, 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 online economy, whether that's really going to offset um, you know, the additional frictional costs for NI consumers uh, as a result of, of uh, uh, um, uh, the regulatory border, I, I, it's very difficult to know. But I do think that is probably one area where Northern Ireland does get best of both worlds. Brilliant. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, John. If it doesn't, just write a follow up and say you haven't answered my question and we'll try and come back to you. Uh, I have this wonderful power virtually to allow John Pete to talk. And I'm now going to click the allow John Pete to talk button and see what happens. So, John, when you're ready. You're on mute. All right. Now, I think I'm. Can you hear me now? Oh, this is fantastic. It's a try. Oh. Technology, it works better remotely than it does when you're in, in the um, in London. Um, now, I, I, I actually wanted to ask two sort of re but they're related questions. One, one was this mercantilist point, which actually Jill mentioned. I mean, for a long time, Brexiteers said the EU needs us more than we need them because German car makers, Italian pasta makers need the UK market. And I just wondered in this area whether it works the other way around, that actually a lot of service... Uh, providers in Germany, France and elsewhere will be anxious not to give the UK a deal because this is where the UK is good. I'm thinking of German lawyers, architects and so on, which makes it much harder for the UK to, to get a good deal. Um, there will be more resistance um, here than in, than in the goods area. And the related point was if they do have a lot more services provisions written into the FDA, does that turn, is that more likely to turn it into a mixed agreement and not um, an EU agreement, which makes ratification much more difficult. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. And um, I think this relate question of interdependence between the EU and the UK on services is really um, fascinating. And I think in some sectors, I would agree with you. Um, particularly actually probably business services. Um, I think though there's a really interesting um, area, Adam Tooze has written a bit about this, around the, um, the extent to which the EU requires liquidity from London's capital markets and may require that more um, in the wake of um, coronavirus. Um, and hence I think that's maybe why financial services gets teased out separately in that the interdependencies work differently for financial services compared to the um, rest of the service sector and on that I very much agree with um, Peter's earlier points when I was um, reading through the UK's um, draft agreement the more I read it the more it became clear that the UK was asking for things on services which really showed I thought that you know this was an area where the government recognized that there are issues and it's a strategically important sector so um, I just really wanted to um, support Peter's point on that as well I don't have anything more specific to say on that issue. Uh, just to remind the audience do put your hand up if you've got questions to ask I've got a horrible feeling I've just taken someone's hand down who had their hand up in which case stick it back up again and I won't do it again I promise that was just me messing up if it happened and uh, Yes, Peter, off, over to you. Uh, it's an interesting one on, on whether or not, uh, um, you know, the guilds of French or Belgian architects are going to use uh, a Brexit to kind of, you know, keep out those nasty Brits who are quite good at services. I, I mean, the answer is nobody knows. And if you get into bilateral, into a situation where all the agreements are bilateral, which you would in this scenario, maybe. But I would just observe that, during the negotiation, the preparation for the negotiation, when you see readouts of the discussions of member state delegates with the commission, generally speaking, the delegates, uh, the member states have been pushing um, for a more liberal approach. And it's the commission saying, no, 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 let's not give, you know, that, that's an offensive interest. Let's not give anything away here. 
Um, and, and your sense you get maybe is that actually, if the UK comes on, on side uh, to the extent that the EU can live with on, on, on the governance piece and on the level playing field piece, then actually um, member states will want a reasonably smooth and functional uh, and maybe the capital markets liquidity issue plays into that. I honestly, that's not my, my area. But I just observe that in the negotiations, you don't, apart from the French, of course, the blessed French, but apart from the French, you don't sort of get an overwhelming sense that, uh, um, you know, the Germans and others, I mean, who, for example, have been pushing for conformity assessments on, uh, for medicines, pharma, GMPs, etc. cetera, um, good manufacturing processes, you know, equivalents, recognitions. So I, I wonder whether, I wonder whether, to my earlier point that actually uh, um, in, in practice it's less it's less aggressive than, than we think assuming that we that we get a deal um, as for mixity isn't uh, am I right I think I'm right in saying Annan probably knows this better than I do but I think that the, the, the point at the moment is that a lot of this is going to be done um, uh, in, on, a, on a 217 on a majority basis and therefore the bits that might be mixed, can be hived off separately, so that so that mixty doesn't so the mixty question doesn't become a block to ratifying the deal. At least that's how, that's how I understood it. But I maybe I think I think that's how I understood it. I think that's how I understand it as well. Though whether or not, I mean it runs into the question slightly of how much the EU is willing to hive off into separate things, because of course that runs into the principle of the single structure uh but it's certainly this is when we really need catherine barnard around but yes that is how i do understand it and if i hear different from her i will report back but yes do either of jill or nicole want to nicole's nodding yeah just just on that point about um sort of the mercantilism and i think it plays into almost like peter's question about um sort of preparedness as well some of this is about importance but it's also about how high the barriers are going to be so Financial services, obviously a huge amount of our services trade um, with the EU. Um, we know that that is going to face very high barriers um, uh, to trade um, because we are no longer going to be um, part of the single market. Um, I think on the preparedness side, that's that feeds in because it's, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be ready. They have been working on this for a very long time and um, their regulators have been very good about that. Um, uh, so yes, you're, you're hearing less um, from the sector about those concerns. Business services, as Sarah, Sarah says, is another huge component of our um, services trade, and it, and it is an incredibly varied amount of our services trade. And actually, it's astonishing to me as an aside how much we talk about architects, which is a smidgen of a fraction, like a, hundred, like a couple of millions um, in terms of our trade with the EU, it's tiny. Um, but the barriers to business services trade are actually relatively low. Um, uh, they are more around people, than anything else and actually what the UK is negotiating will probably deal with a lot of those barriers. It's not like in, in chemicals and food where you just have these reams and reams of regulation and changes. So that is kind of why you might not see as much push from negotiators to focus on them because those services will more or less um, be all right. You know, if you, um, often when we're talking about US trade, we talk about how businesses have pretty much got used to the rock in the ocean and they go around it. Um, the rocks in the ocean for services trade are much smaller than like the boulders in goods trade. So, so that's why I think you get some of that preparedness element, but also why you hear less um, about the UK really pushing for it. Realistically, the big thing that we could fight for on services trade is around financial services. We do obviously need the equivalents, but we're not getting more on that. We're like, I think we all know that. So that I think is, is, is why I, I, I think also slightly more is in the UK's control in terms of what it does for its services sector compared with its good sectors. Its good sectors will hit those barriers of EU regulations, having to go through EU testing, having to go through customs processes, whereas actually a lot of services trade is about what you do and um, bringing people in um, to the UK and what you do in terms of your mobility and your, your domestic immigration rules. And I certainly see those um, uh, immigration rules actually being much more important to a lot of services businesses in comparison to the negotiation side. Brilliant. Jill, do you want to chip in? OK, uh, we've got a question from Mark Latham. Hi, Mark. On what are the prospects for the UK's 10 trillion pound asset management industry, which has already seen around a trillion pounds of assets being shifted to the EU 27? 
I am, I'm looking at you, Sarah, even if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Um, so asset management is um, one of the parts of the services sector where some of the early signs are that there have been relocations. Um, I think an important point here is that any change in London as a financial centre will be gradual. And I think there's um, signs that that is already underway, which in some ways makes tracking it um, harder. And the other key point is that I think it's important to note that at the moment it doesn't look like it's going to be a, a, a straightforward kind of London declines and Frankfurt, for example, emerges as the EU's um, financial centre. Asset management is a really good example of this because it looks like some of the early relocations in asset management are particularly interested in Dublin um, and to prob possibly a slightly lesser extent um, Luxembourg. And I think asset management is also one of the areas within financial services um, where um, not being a rule taker and being able to um, take advantage of more regulatory autonomy is seen as quite a significant advantage um, at the end of the transition period. And again, I, I think that's important because it shows that different parts of the financial services sector are differentially exposed here. So what this means for asset management is quite different to what it means for um, retail banks um, and also the kind of mid and back office functions of financial services that often aren't in London at all, but are in places like Peterborough, Swindon and um, Northampton, which are very differentially exposed to, to Brexit and the end of transition. Anyone else on asset management? Okay, we've got a question from an anonymous attendee, which had me worried to start with in case it was one of my kids trolling me online or something, but actually it has capital letters in, so it's not. Uh, has the case for Brexit been strengthened by the EU's perceived failings over its response to COVID-19? Slightly broader question there. Uh, but I mean, I suppose it's, it's, it's almost a British politics question as opposed to anything. I mean, Jill, do you have any thoughts on that? Whether... Uh, I actually don't think it's probably made that much different. The thing to remember is that public health is a member state competence, not a community competence. So actually the, the sort of, you know, the key response there had to come first of all from, uh, from member states. And um, I think what is interesting, um, is that if the referendum had gone the other way, if it had been 52% uh, to stay in, 48% um, no, I think that you would have seen a lot more in the papers now uh, dominating whether actually we were being constrained, the EU is being hopeless, were we mixed up in this completely hopeless institution, doesn't it show that actually the 52% were completely wrong? Uh, and I think of many of those things would have sort of you know, refracted through that debate. Assuming we'd stayed as polarised after that referendum result as we have stayed now, what is quite interesting, I think, is the way that an Anand and uh, others at UK Exchange have written on this, the way in which actually quite a lot of the sort of lockdown response debate has also been polarising, particularly in Parliament, and it's got a piece in the Post today, uh, around the sort of, you know, if you're a Brexit uh, supporter, in Parliament, you're more likely to be a lockdown sceptic and things like that. So I think it's quite interesting how that was done. I think we would have seen huge amounts in the British press about, uh, particularly the Eurosceptic press, about the hopelessness of the EU response and that might have conditioned attitudes, but I'm not sure it would have made a substantive difference. I suppose the flip side of that, I'll come to you in a second, Peter, is, is that I think the response to COVID has shown the first practical example of a way in which the EU has managed to get things done that it really wouldn't have been able to do if the UK had still been in there. I mean, if you look at the budget package that they're talking about now and the industrial policy elements and things like that, this is the re first really concrete thing that I can think of. There might be regulations that I've missed or something where the EU is profiting from the UK not being there for doing things that the UK would almost certainly have blocked had we still been around the table. But Peter. Yes, uh, 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 mismanaging COVID is a kind of globally competitive industry, I, I, I suspect. Um, I, I would just I would make an observation. I think it's quite interesting, actually, how, uh, ironically, COVID, um, it seems to me, in the kind of autarkic uh, uh, industrial policy outlook, you know, you're hearing quite a lot of that out of bits, out of the vote levy bits of number 10, funnily enough, just as you're hearing, uh, you're hearing it in, in Europe too. Um, it may be that actually response to COVID is, 
in terms of a kind of leftward shift where the state takes on the burden of being the insurer of last resort, etc. Fun enough, drives us to looking slightly more like Europe than we might otherwise have done. Um, the other practical point I would make is do not underestimate the extent to which um, COVID has um, sucked the bandwidth out of these negotiations, the Brexit negotiations. It's not just that video conferencing is a rubbish way to do negotiations because you can't, um, you know, take your, your other, your, your compadre around the corner for a quick coffee and a chat and get over your skis and say some things you wouldn't say on the record in negotiation and build the basis for compromises going ahead. Um, you see now, real, or you have seen proper member state disengagement, I think. It's been really hard to get member states to really think about it. Um, I mean, for example, you saw Barnier in recent weeks trying to get um, member states to give him a bit more bandwidth on fish. Mm. You'll remember that the member states forced him to have a much tighter mandate, which he knew he couldn't negotiate. He went back to them, the eight coastal states, and just got sat on. And one of the reasons he got sat on was simply that you know, the Brits weren't moving and, and, and the stuff that really needs to move on the mandate in order for there to be a deal requires bandwidth from the chiefs, from the, from, from the, from the prime ministers and, 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 and chancellors. And it's just not been there. And so what you hear in Brussels is a real sort of sense of disengagement. Someone said to me, now everyone refers to, to, to the UK like they, with, the, with the Brits, you know, like they grew up on the Falls Road. Um, it, it's a sort of... Um, it's, it's quite, it has toxified the atmosphere in some way because the refusal to seek an extension at a time when everyone is so deeply engaged in, in tackling coronavirus, um, you know, has, has definitely, I think, you know, taken a lot of the wind out of the negotiation, which will come back, assuming we don't get another massive second wave uh, in the autumn. Anyone else want to come in or? I'm going to come, there is a question on hedge funds I'm going to come back to, but Stephen Castle, I'm going to, press your allow to talk button and let's see if this works. This is going so well. Over to you, Stephen. Unmute, Does it, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. And thank you very much for the interesting, um, very interesting presentations. Um, to, uh, just a couple of very quick questions. Firstly, can somebody talk a little bit about data? What's going on with that? Uh, secondly, I remember a few years ago, there was this argument that it was very difficult in fact, impossible to um, differentiate between goods and services because, you know, your computer system in your, your car, export, exported car was, you know, what's goods, what's services. Has that become an issue at all in the negotiation? And thirdly, just on the timetable, um, possibly more a kind of Nicole one, but um, what sort of sort of um, warning I mean how much notice does a, a company need in order for this trade deal to make sense on services in other words you know if we get something on December the 31st is it still valuable or will most companies on and um, that that are going to trade in services have uh, already had to adapt by then who wants to kick off on this panelists I can. Yep, thanks, Nicole. Um, on data, I, I guess there's three there. I'll, I'll start with data. Um, yeah, data has been incredibly quiet. Um, I think, uh, so we know that the UK and the EU need to strike an adequacy agreement. Um, and Peter might well have the gossip, but I do not, um, uh, as is often the case. Um, uh, but we were certainly expecting that around summertime, um, we would expect to have some sort of update on where we are going with data adequacy. Um, we know that the shortest uh, agreement for data adequacy to date has been 18 months, um, but there were always commitments from both sides to get it done by the end of the year. Um, there was sort of from, from the UK kind of saying, well, we're already adequate, we already, um, we already have implemented GDPR, um, this should be an easy process. Um, from the EU side, I think there was always going to be an additional amount of scrutiny on the UK. I think the UK has um, historically gone on some different directions to some of the EU um, on its national legislation, I'm thinking in particular the Investigatory Powers Act, um, which will certainly come under the scrutiny um, uh, of these groups doing the actual adequacy agreement. Um, uh, I'm actually not sure how, how far the UK has got in terms of kind of submitting all of the evidence, um, et cetera, into why it should be adequate, um, uh, but, but others might be able to answer that. 
Um, on the amount of time that businesses need in services, yeah, you're right. It, it's, it's probably less in services than it is in goods. Um, uh, when you talk about goods adapting to goods businesses adapting to a new deal, you are talking about how are we going to adapt very physical processes, and um, that's not quite as true um, in services. With the expect, uh, with the exception of financial services, which have always needed six months, and um, that has been a pretty um, consistent amount of time from them throughout this process. And um, so we're definitely coming up to that moment. Um, uh, so we know that it, it seems unlikely that we're going to be getting um, an equivalent agreement uh, this month as, as was, was always scheduled to be. So that is sort of a, 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 an actual concrete delay that we will be experiencing. Um, I'd say data is one area where you do need a little bit of warning. Um, uh, certainly in the last couple of rounds of kind of no deal scares, if you like, we've had lots of conversations with companies who are having to kind of insert these standard contractual clauses um, with thousands of clients. Um, uh, to allow data flows to continue. Um, that is a challenging thing to do. It's an expensive thing to do. Um, it's profitable if you're a lawyer. Um, uh, you have to do that kind of through your new contracts. We also know that those um, adequacy agreements are due to have a judgment on them, I think. Um, sorry, those contractual clauses are due to have a judgment on them as to whether or not they're sufficient, um, which was going to affect um, uh, whether we can do that next time around. Um, so, so that is something we're keeping an eye on. But I think in general for services businesses, it is more about what the future looks like and how easy it is to operate into the future. And I think that's true um, uh, for just the services industries as a whole. You know, um, what does our long term look like, I think is more important than some of those immediate changes um, that you might be worried about. Um, but I'll that. Can I just come in there, Alan? Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and I don't have more to add specifically on data, but I just wanted to jump off on Nicole's point around, around future proofing, because I think there's some quite clear indications in the UK draft agreement that the UK negotiators are concerned about that. And in the report, I talk about one really specific thing. It seems really tiny. Um, but the definition of who counts as a financial services provider in the UK agreement, the UK is including the phrase um, individual or businesses who supply it now or wish to in the future. So this idea of kind of future proofing it. I think this um, is really important in areas like financial services where innovation and the sort of production of new financial markets is really a hallmark of the UK's strength in that sector. Um, so, you know, developing fintech markets, for example, might be one area that the UK is looking to seek to, to protect there. And I think that comes back to the and um, one of the original questions that you raised, Anand, that the definition of what services are and what services will be in the future is actually a really hard question to answer. And I think that makes um, agreeing a deal quite difficult. So how services relate to manufacturing changes, what's included in services and what services will be are not fixed answers. And that, that's important, I think. I mean, that was part of Stephen's question, I think, was this issue of services that are bundled with goods and the issue of, you know, has this been, been a, a problem in the negotiations that uh, untangling services and, and manufacturing is actually sometimes a lot harder than you might think? Go on then, Peter. Um, yeah, just, just very quickly on data. The Commission was always clear internally that it wouldn't deliver an adequacy decision any time uh, soon. So, you know, it's another example where the Commission is holding back where it could, um, de de you know, deliver adequacy given our GDPR status. That said, you shouldn't underestimate how different the outlook is in data in some parts of the EU. And if the UK becomes very sort of American in its approach, that's a real problem in Germany, right? You remember Safe Harbour was knocked down uh, uh, by the Schrems case and they had to build privacy shield and fall back on standard contract clauses. Um, and when you talk to the people involved in that American decision, it takes a long time. You know, getting the CIA or GCHQ, because as a third country now, our data adequacy decision now must incorporate um, our security services, et cetera, right? And, and, you know, you go back to the bugging of Angela Merkel's phone, five eyes, et cetera. It's not an absolute given, actually, that, um, you know, the UK uh, is seen as a kind of, you know, guaranteed to be compliant. And there are real substantive rocks in the road, I think, I think there. I'm not saying that that's where it'll end up, but there are places where that could be quite difficult. On the bundling of goods and services, it's always been 
you know, one of the kind of disagreements is the extent to which if you talk to people in the commission, they'll make always make a huge deal about why they want level playing field on environment, on, on, on regulations, et cetera, et cetera. It's precisely this, uh, this, this question of bundling. And, and you've seen different reports about the place, about the extent to which it really is actually contingent on the price of goods, the extent to which these things are bundled. But I can tell you the commission will continue to make a big deal of it as it argues for the UK to sign up to its level playing field commitments. Did anyone want to add anything? Uh, we've, we've had a question from Takashi to which I think the answer is, is no, because uh, he says there's, there's been some progress on financial services. Will there be an agreement on that that can stand on its own if there's no other agreement on anything? And I think absolutely not. The EU will not uh, give us a deal on financial services unless it gets a lot of what it wants as well, uh, which is one of the reasons why you have this absurd situation of fish being a priority. I mean, the EU wants to get what it wants to get and isn't just going to give us a deal on that. We've got another uh, anonymous attendee, or maybe the same anonymous attendee, you can't tell, uh, asking about hedge funds. I, you know, a lot was made about the fact that, you know, hedge fund managers supported Brexit, but how will... Uh, Brexit impact on the hedge fund industry? Um, I think the important point here to say is that this isn't the first time that the hedge fund industry has um, threatened departures from the UK to secure regulatory advantages. So um, for my sins, I teach a final year course on the geographies of money and finance. And we always use the example of hedge funds um, being very concerned about the regulatory changes after the financial crisis. And we present a whole series of newspaper headlines at the time about hedge funds that were about to move to Switzerland um, and then didn't. And I think that that's important to note that quite a lot of the stories around the potential relocation of hedge funds or indeed other parts of the financial services sector can be as much around positioning and um, regulatory demands as it might be around a very tangible, you know, we are ready to um, establish an office in Switzerland um, tomorrow. And I think that's important to note. Um, I think the second slightly more existential question really is, and this goes back to a point that, that Jill raises, um, is the relationship between London's financial district and the rest of the UK economy and, and hedge funds are a really important part of, of that question. Um, so, um, you know, it, is London going to become some sort of version of what's often termed Singapore on Thames and slightly divorced or increasingly divorced from the rest of the country? Or are we trying to um, use finance to fund and fuel um, economic development across the UK? And I think the, the case of hedge funds is actually central to that because what makes sense for them in terms of their corporate strategy might actually be quite different to what might work for UK PLC. Interesting. Jill. Oh, Jill. Just wanted to go on to Cashy's because <clears throat> technically financial services, there's stuff about regulatory cooperation on financial services, which is uh, in the proposed UK FTA, but the equivalence decision is a sort of freestanding unilateral decision by the EU. They could do it if they wanted to without a trade agreement where a third country were applying for mm. equivalence. It's just that the politics suggests that uh, that that's very unlikely. Indeed, we had Varadkar early in the year saying you won't get a financial services deal without a fish deal uh, and explicitly making those linkages. But technically, they could give the UK yeah. equivalence decisions yeah. without a completing FTA. Does anyone else want to come in? We're almost at the end of our time. So if there, are, there don't seem to be any more questions. So on that note, then, let me firstly thank Peter and Nicole in particular for taking the time to do this. Thank you to all our audience. I hope you found this useful and interesting. I'm sure, like me, you're very keen to eat on the hour every hour during lockdown. So we've been here for an hour now, so it must be time for another meal. Uh, and we've got a series of things coming out over the next few weeks. If you're interested, we have something on a sort of stock take of the negotiations next week we've got something on fish coming out at the end of next week we've got something on manufacturing coming out the week after so uh, we hope as many of you as possible can join us for events around those and in the meantime keep well take care of yourselves i hope we can see each other in person in the not too distant future have a very good day thank you all <laughs>